Hamptons and welcome to another episode of Hambini's Engineering Show. In today's episode we have what has almost given me a complete orgasm on six separate occasions since it came through the door. We have this. Behold, the Time Skylon made and engineered in France and therefore it is the dog's bollocks. Now you might be wondering why this is in here and this is the last frame that I would expect to be in here because they are usually the best and it is something that I aspire to buying. Well, a chap bought a Hambini BB, he put it in his bike uh, and then he consequently had some problems trying to fit this. Now from our friend Bruno in Italy um, this FSA K-Force BB386 Evo crank um, and he had a few issues putting it in there. Now, the other thing he said was he said one of the bearings was a bit tight. So let's go through the frame and try and fix the fucker. So this is the Time Skylon. Um, now I've had this for a little while now to look through it and to basically have multiple orgasms over it as I've just mentioned. This is pretty much the best that you can get in terms of carbon fiber manufacturing. The NDT guy said this is the dog's bollocks, it pisses all over everything else he's seen, even the look bike. Now time bikes are made in a different way. So they are what's known as well, RTM manufacturing, which is woven. So each of these parts is actually a weave rather than um, the other method, which is pre-preg, which is car basically carbon fiber cloth with some epoxy um, put in between to make up as filler. But this is different. So this is, well, engineered as the dog's bollocks. Now these things aren't very popular because first of all, time doesn't really have the marketing capability of other people and the way this thing's made is not cheap so you can clearly see this is made in multiple pieces which is nothing abnormal but you've got the bottom bracket there flared chain stays um, a joint here so all that piece is probably one piece another joint there um, compressed carbon dropouts that, uh, that is nice isn't it and then um, I mean one of the flaws of this bike is probably the second hand retail value because you end up having to cut the seat post. But I mean, when you look through there, the way that's made, flipping neck. Um, and that's the, the fork. The other thing with this, and I guess this is more marketing bullshit, is they have something called a vibration absorption system in here. So, um, Essentially, that just means the fibers that have been put in there are uh, different. So normally you'd have carbon fiber of a certain stiffness. They can put um, whatever they want in there to uh, to reduce the effect of vibration. So this is pretty much the best you can get. Um, I, was so tempted, I was tempted to buy one of these, actually. I was that impressed with it. Now, in terms of the bottom bracket, this um, is a BB386 Evo bottom bracket. Um, it is 86 and a half millimeters that way and it's a 46 millimeter hole. It's effectively a, a widened PF30, a very much widened PF30. Now one of the things that has come up is bearing on this side is ever so slightly stiff. Um, I won't say it's excessively stiff but you can just feel a little notch and there's no notch around there, but at this point when I apply load, I can feel just a little click. So there's something not quite right in there, so we need to fix that. The other more pressing matter is this. So the, the basic reason why the chaps sent this back is he had problems fitting this. Um, so we'll, we'll first of all sort the bottom bracket out and then come to this. Right, this, we, first of all, we need to get this bottom bracket out just to have a look to see what's going on. Now, it'd be pretty arrogant of me to say there's nothing wrong with my bottom bracket. I mean, that, that possibility always exists. 
Um, there could be a fitting error or there could be something wrong with the frame. Um, yeah, time frames are good, but they're not infallible either. So uh, what we'll do is we'll get the bottom bracket out first. Now to remove it, you can use, well, this is the way that industrial bearings are removed, which is using a sleeve um, and the part that came with the bottom bracket. So you just get a couple of washers and a nut, slide that through. So it locates, screw the nut on. Okay, and then we just turn. And it'll bring tension. Quite often it clicks, but it hasn't on this one. Might be because the bottom bracket is RTM. Once you got halfway out, it'll go loose. Like that. Keep spinning. Out it comes, so the bottom bracket, see, come out of the hole. That was the nut. So there's the piece that was used as a removal tool. There's the bottom bracket, and there's the hole. Now the the. The, the bearing is, is not clicking anymore, it doesn't feel stiff at all. So whatever it has happened is between the bottom bracket and the interface in the bike. Now when I um, took this off, I made a mental note of where that clicking noise was. Normally I'd index it by putting a mark actually onto the frame and onto the bottom bracket. But on this occasion, um, it's got NTM bearings in there and there's a... Um, uh, the brand where it's made, so the NTN says made in Japan, above the A is where the click was. There's a corresponding mark on the bottom bracket. Now when I look inside the frame, and this may be extremely difficult to see, um, so I'll get a torch. There is a small sliver of carbon, excess carbon, at the very end and a, a line mark that goes all the way down, which is where the problem area was. Now, oh fuck, how the fuck are you supposed to be able to see this? Okay, so that is probably where the problem is. So I'm just going to remove that now, hopefully. Um, let me see if I can zoom in. Now there's a couple of ways to solve this problem. You could try sanding it. I'm going to try pulling it. So get the old nipex out. Ah, fucking hell. Got a bit of it. Uh, it's just a bit problematic because on my um, pliers they're a bit too um, wide. So I'll try something else. Try these ones. There we go. That is. Believe it or not, that is what was causing the problem. Just that. So we got that out. Okay. 
I am going to measure this, but people like the um, the old dial gauge or the um, step gauge test. So we've got 45.96. This is supposed to be 46. Well, it's supposed to be 45.95 to 46. So that's 45.96. That goes in. 45.98 is tight, but it just about goes in. Forty six doesn't go in, and if we shine a light round it, unlike the boardman, there's no holes, <laughs> there's no no gaping uh, lines of light. So um, yeah, that's really quite good. It's the same thing. If we do the same thing on the other side. So this was the problematic side. We've got uh, forty five point nine six. 5.98, there you go, 46, just goes, 46.02 doesn't go, so that is well within tolerance, well it's actually perfect, it's a perfect tolerance, um, and we've just removed that piece of carbon from the other side. Now we come on to the FSA K-Force crank set, and if you look it says PB386 EVO, and some other numbers, 113 to 120.9L. No idea what those mean, um, but this is brand spanking new, so that, that's what uh, the chap wanted to fit. And um, this one's made in Taiwan, so literally this just bolts on to there, and then you tighten the uh, screw and it'll draw it on. It's got some splines there that have got a slight taper. So uh, if I to show you a taper, there's my vernier. You can see there's a, a slight taper on the, there's a gap there. Taper on the splines, corresponding spline to taper on the other side. Now, there's a couple of issues with this crank. The main one being the diameter here and the diameter here aren't quite the same. Um, and that tends to be, well, for a number of reasons, um, but it's, it's just a sign of shit manufacturing. The other thing, when, you, when you're buying 30mm axles, there is, I guess, they're, they're missold to a certain extent. Um, they are sold in terms of spindle length. Now, officially, the spindle length that the industry has taken is the distance between there and there, and it's a completely fucking pointless measurement that was clearly invented by a dickhead. So that's quite irrelevant. What is important is the gap in between when you put the crank arms together. So I've got a Shimano one here, purely because it's just easier for me to assemble. So when you put that same kind of uh, setup, but this one isn't using splines, uh, sorry, tapers on the spline. So you put that onto there, and then screw the preload nut on. And it will force it all back. Okay, the key distance is the distance between there and there. That is your effective axle length. Now, on Shimano crank sets, that is always, almost always, 90 to 91 millimeters. And that's what it should be on your bike. On 30mm axles, this length can vary quite considerably, so you need to shim it, and it's a bit of a shite design, really. The other problem is, if you've got something with shite manufacturing tolerances, as this is, um, the angle of the spline and the point which the spline go um, heavily, infl heavily influence where this arm sits. So if I was to bolt this back up, so let's do that. As I apply more torque, that is moving it further along. Now if you are going for a displacement preload system, then that distance affects where it should be. On this particular crank, it's moving, the, the arm is further in than it should be. So when the guy's gone to fit it, he's torqued it up to the right setting and it's effectively crushed the bearing. So that's that issue. The other problem is 
Now he tells me he bought this crankset in Ukraine. Now, I don't want to knock Ukrainian bicycling shops, but this must be one of the older models because it has this shitty little lip on the inside. So when you put the bearing on, when you put the bearing on, it rubs up against the black bit and then that slows you down some more. So there we go. So if you are going to try and um, get the, you know, the axle length, it's sometimes difficult to measure. So if we take the Shimano crankset again, you know, to get your vernier in there, it's quite difficult. So what you can do is you can use a couple of spacers. So these spacers are zero it combined 18 and a half millimeters if I pop that onto there so we'll put it in that way I'm only doing this for uh, just to show you but once you put that there, so we've got 18 and a half at 71.4, 71.5, that's near enough for your 90 millimeters. So that's, that's the sort of level of accuracy you need. Don't need anything more than that. You can do the same thing with the, um, with a 30 mil axle, what I suggest you use is a bearing. So you just slide the bearing over. You can see it slid over there really easy, but on that one, it's quite tight. I need to push quite hard to get it to go. And there, it's really tight. <laughs> so, so just the very end of it is just a shit fit. So you put that on, or put two or three of those on, and bolt that up, and then literally take the measurement again. You can use a ruler, or, I mean a ruler measurement will be fine. Right, it is now time for everyone's favourite part of the show, PowerPoint. Now, if I've done this correctly, I've made some modifications to the, um, well, the PowerPoint said it better. Someone with some intelligence actually set this up for me. Um, so much so, they're too intelligent for me. Right, let's fucking does this work? Ah, here we go, right, yeah. If time made vaginoirs, the word cunt wouldn't exist. That is correct. If time made vaginoirs, the word cunt wouldn't exist. I thought this was absolutely poetic um, and brilliant. By Hamini, age five. We won't talk about the t-shirts this week, but they are coming. I have found a new supplier. Um, right, time. Who are they? Well, they were recently sold off by the French company Rossignol. Um, so if I click on this link here, um, so I just found this on the website. In fact, loads of people contacted me about this. Um, uh, so the sale hasn't gone through and it's going through in the summer. So that's, if you're watching this, March, well, it's, uh, 2020, probably by September, it's going to be going somewhere. So they've been bought by this company called What For Now. Uh, this is their web page, um, and their products. Um, they look quite impressive really, they're like mountain bikes with this huge stem. Mm. And is that belt drive? I think that is belt drive. So, uh, no, it's chain. That looks like a chain. Oh, it's chain and belt. There's a belt in there, look. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Right, products. Um, I've clicked on that, haven't I? Team. So, all these people, I've never heard of any of them, <laughs> but but if you have, um, yeah, they all they all seem to be ski cross people. But there you go, and loads of like social media po posts and stuff. Um, find us. Um, so these are all their dealers. Yeah, um, and that's enough of that. Right. So let's carry on with more shit. Time are uh, most famous for pedals. Um, so them and look to fine French companies. Vive la France, Allez les Bleus. Um, Poutin, yes. 
conciliatory Putin de chien. Um, yeah. Cafe cleats. So I mean, the thing with the time pedal, if anyone's used a time pedal, is it like engages, well not weird, but it's just a different way of engaging compared to um, say a Look or a Shimano SPD SL. I mean, Shimano SPD SLs and Look are almost the same. Okay, the actual geometry is different, but the way they work is the same. But the time one is is different. Um, so anyway, right. Uh, widely known for having a shite dealer network. <laughs> Everyone I know who speaks about time says the dealer network is shit. So um, there you go. And their production is a bit of a mixture between France and Slovakia. Both of those are in Europe, so um, at least they're within the same continent and probably the same time zone. I'm pretty sure Slovakia is Central European time. Um, right, this frame, so this is the look, sorry, not the look, got Freudian slip there. This is the time frame. Um, let me see if I can... Oh, fuck. I'll put it on the wrong monitor. Fuck. Hold on while I adjust the pen. Shit. D -d 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 -d. Apply. Right, let's have a go again. Ah, oh, yes, we got it right, right. So this is, right, so the thing with the time frame is, can I turn the pen color change? Pen, pen, ink color. Make it red. Right, let's just have a little doodle. Doodle in the bottom. Ah, oh, fucking hell yes! I love this pen thing. I've been um, uh, trying to get my um, wanking hand to give me better coordination. <sighs> Mrs. Sambini says my coordination has gotten better since I used this. Right, this thing is made in multiple pieces. So there's one there, one there, and you can clearly see the joint. Well, you might not be able to clearly see the joint, but in real life, you can clearly see the joint. Now, when you do it like that, and um, you're, you're liable to get um, defects in there. But when I had this scanned, there was absolutely no defects. Um, and the NDT guy said the manufacturing quality on this was excellent. It was by far the best he'd seen. Um, I mean, he thought the Cannondale one the other week was good. He said this one is better. So. I mean, I, I can't really fault it. Um, so there we go. So that, I mean, this really is a piece of carbon and the way someone has taken the time to make it, even when you look down the insides of it and all that kind of stuff, it really is well made, very well made. Obviously there was the um, small uh, piece of carbon that was in there, okay? But I'll probably let them off that. Um, so the piece that, that's shoved out I think more than likely my bottom bracket, as the chap was pushing it through, came dropped down and then flicked it up, and that's what caused the problem. Um, but I mean, easy to fix, and uh, or is it a fault of the frame? I mean, you could argue that, or you could argue it's the fault of my bottom bracket because because it's not smooth. I don't know, um, but it's it's you know in the grand scheme of things, it's a minor problem. Um, yeah, I mean it is just really really good right um next thing is right this this way this thing is made is by a system called rtm which is um uh is, is very different to normal carbon manufacturing now normal well no, i say normal is I mean, rtm is used extensively in aerospace um because the final product is stronger and you can also tune some of the material properties um it's like a weave. So if I go to the next slide, so this is this is how RTM is made. Um, you've got uh, it's like a you've got um, if you look, there's like thick black fibers, which is here, thin white fibers, and then um, there's some sort of medium fibers there. So they're all different. And then when you get to the end you can see the hash up of all of these different things as they go through. It is extremely strong, extremely strong. Um, so as I've just mentioned, you can change the material characteristics. So if you put some Kevlar in there, what they use for bulletproof vests, that will um, 
change the material characteristics versus pure carbon. Kevlar makes the material much tougher, so it's less likely to fracture because carbon um, is not like, you know, if you, if you bang a piece of metal, it just dents. Carbon doesn't, it tends to just crack and then you're left into a load of pieces. So that's what that is. Um, and with RTM, you are much less likely to get voids. Um, voids are when there's a small cavity in the carbon fiber layers. Um, but with this, you're less likely to get that than um, with conventional, what's known as pre-preg. Pre um, and for, for cylindrical objects, it is you know, much, much better for uh, for strength because the fibers are running in that direction yeah they're um in that direction and they're also woven so they're in a spiral as well so they're extremely strong whereas when you use uh conventional techniques you have an overlap so an overlap would be you know if i drew here okay one layer of carbon stops and then another layer starts and then you've got that. So you've got uh, an overlap, which is here. Yeah, that's your overlapping carbon layer. With um, uh, RTM, you've got that and then another layer that does that. It's just a, we a weave. So it's much stronger. Um, but all of these things have a opportunity cost and that opportunity cost is it is an extremely difficult technique to master now the people that are very good at this are the areas of the world where loom machines loom is that right where they're into loom machines because that's the kind of thing so you're weaving cloth and those areas are those places are technically competent so it's very very difficult to do it a lot of the um, RTM stuff comes from um, you know, the, these areas of France and uh, Italy, you know, in, in Aero. So you can see here, I've left the ink there, but bollocks. Um, how do I get rid of the ink? Not that button. Clear ink. Shit. Uh, pointer options. Right. Um, you can quite clearly see the weave. Yeah, but you can see the weave in the. Uh, this is the fork of that uh, of the time skylon. Um, you can see the weave in there. So that time have put some fibers in there, and they call it active damping. It's to give you a um, less vibration through the handle. So if you were to let's say, let me draw. This is a graph of vibration. If you were to take conventional carbon fiber um, and then give it some vibration, what would happen is you would tend to do that. So it would vibrate. Okay, if you were to do the same thing with um, RTM with some Kevlar in it, okay, you start off at the same point, what would happen is it would do that. That's called damping. So you've you've effectively you kill the vibration in a much shorter period of time. So on that that's T, and that's uh, vibe. Yeah. So it's it's really very good. Right. Comparison. Now here is um, the time frame, and. Um, this is just a measure of the axial you know, deviation. So the time's there. And then if I show you there, you can just about see, and this is zoomed into the max, where the defect is. So that's the defect, and it is 50 microns, or 0.05 millimeters, which is um, two thousandths of an inch. So if I carry on and then show you some of the other shit that turns up, uh, oh, fuck. Right, if you look at this Orbea frame on the left hand side, I mean, look here. Look there. And there. Oh, sorry. And here. 
look at the width. Yeah, absolutely dreadful. Complete crap. Um, and then if you look at the Boardman bike on the right hand side, so what I've done here is I've put a gauge in, so I've put a standard gauge in, um, and you can see how out around this hole is. Look at that. That obviously you can't see around the top of it, but you can see the so what you can see is locally in this area the mould has um, shrunk um, so there you go uh, so bottom bracket measurements um, where's my pen gone? oh it's there, shit <laughs> so, so um, what I've done here is I've plotted the time Skylon against the Orbea and uh, the um, I'm just going to have to change the pen colour. Right, so I can see it. So the, I mean, look at, I mean, look at the time frame. It is just, oh fuck. So I mean, if you look at the time frame, um, it is just so round. Um, I can't believe I'm saying it. It's just round. Whereas the, the. Or Bayer and the, um, the, I mean the Canyon one. Look at it, dreadful, absolutely dreadful, absolutely dreadful. Um, I don't really know what to say to that. I mean, it, I'm praising someone for making a hole that's round. <laughs> it's difficult, but when all these other people aren't making them round, it's easy to make yourself look good. So the alignment. Is the dog's bollocks and the fit is the dog's bollocks so there you go um this is the axial run out so i showed you um just two slides ago the deviation so the deviation it was 50 microns so the deviation is actually here on the time frame compare that you know between there and there is where the deviation is. Wow, if you compare that to, um, I mean, look at the distance between there and there. That's the, that's the Orbea frame, yeah. The distance between the top and the bottom on the, um, the time frame is so small, I can't even draw it. It's really, really small, um, yeah. That's, I just don't know what to say really. Right, now we come on to the FSA crank. Now, the FSA crank was first first shown um, in a video that I did where a Danish national team mechanic sent me an FSA crank and said there's a problem with it. Um, so it was a Danish FSA, uh, Danish, national cycling team mechanic and um, a Danish marine engineer called Jesper who was a complete and total hoot. Um, the, this, ah, fuck. Basically, the, the crank, if I can draw it, impeded, impinges here. So the black bit impinges on the bearing seal. So when it impinges on the bearing seal, uh, which is also here, you end up with a load of drag. Now, in the original video, I wasn't sure if it was FSA or Power to Max who did this, but this crank doesn't have a power meter, so I'm assuming it's FSA. Now, FSA did contact me about this and tell, told me they'd redesigned it, but obviously the ones that are out there are still there. So Bruno from FSA said the new ones are flat. Um, so. I mean, if you're going to get a new one, you'll probably be all right. So that's one issue. The other issue is this. So the distance between, um, I mean, the crank arm goes here. That's the non-drive side crank arm. Drive side crank arm goes here, or drive side chain rings goes here. Fucking hell, I can't draw. The, that distance can vary it's supposed to be 86.5 but it can vary in this case 
it was slightly less. So what I had to do was I had to move some of the 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 washers to compensate spaces to compensate. Um, and I'll cover that shortly. Right. The fixes, right. First fix, we'll insert, um, what's the word? Spaces in to delete that seal problem. It's, I mean, the seal problem, what a fucking joke. Uh, and in the process of that, delete the wave washer. Um, we also need to put a center sleeve in just to sort the preload out. Um, I've said this about the dimensions. Right, bottom brackets are extremely sensitive to preload. If you excessively load a bottom bracket, you will not, you'll find it does not rotate very well. So the, you know, if, when you do a spin test, which I will add now, because loads of people get het up on spin tests. If you buy a bottom bracket with full seals, um, you will not get a very good spin test because the seal is rubbing. As you ride the bike, the seal will will wear in and then it will rotate better. So when don't be too upset if you don't spin well on a on a spin test, you know, straight after you put it in. The other things that can affect it are if the, the grab of the bearing is too tight and also if the um Preload is excessive and preload if the preload is excessive, which I will show you on the next slide um, We'll have a problem uh, Also, we need to fix put a center sleeve in to fix the taper lap. So because the Non-drive side crank arm is moving further in and we're not getting the 86 and a half um, We have to put a center sleeve in to to stop that. I'll show you that in the 3d right so if I show you the 3d So this is a cut through of the bottom bracket. Um, what you can see is this piece. Oh, can I select the whole piece? Fuck. Yeah, so this piece that's gone like a teal color, that is um, the drive side spacer. So you have to alter this, this area around here to get it to work. And at the same time, the non-drive side spacer, which has this small lip, so it attaches the bottom race, sorry, to the uh, uh, inner race, uh, or inner ring, as some people like to call it, that width has also got to be adjusted. And then the center sleeve, which is that piece that's now colored teal, um, that is... Um, there to stop excessive preload. I'll take that away. Right, this is the preload. So when you've got your normal bearing, okay, there's a small gap between the ball and the um, inner and outer raceways. So there's the gap there and there. What you need to do is you need to apply the preload, which is here. And as it does this, it moves the whole thing away. So you end up with a contact point here and a contact point here. Now, one of the things that I found is if you are, oh, I suppose in most of Europe, NTN bearings are very, very popular. Um, unfortunately, there's a load of fakes going around. Uh, I did post this on my, um, on my website, you know, beware of fakes. And then a load of other bearing suppliers got in touch going I was being slanderous well not really because people are sending me bearings that have been allegedly supplied by company XYZ um, that are uh, I mean as soon as you scratch them with a knife they just you know put they're just not hardened and the bearing clearance is excessive so this gap here so if I draw the this this oh fuck. This gap. Oh fucking hell. Let me delete the ink. So this gap here is the bearing clearance. Now it's measured in uh, C C is the, the bearing clearance. So you'll see C N is normal bearing clearance and C two, C three, C four, all these C five I think exist. All these things, and that gap is just getting bigger. Now, one of the things I've found is people were using 
um, bearings from the suppliers, mainly in the UK, that um, that they said were genuine NTN bearings uh, and some other brands, and they had excessive bearing clearance. Uh, so that gap is too big, and it fucks the preload up. It royally fucks the preload up. Now, one of these individuals emailed me from this company and said, how do you measure bearing preload? It's foolishly, I didn't really think about this too much because he was having a fucking whinge um, because his business was getting hurt. Um, and uh, I mean, the thing is, I don't know how you can sell a bearing and not know how to measure the bearing clearance. So anyway, the, the bearing clear, so he didn't know basically. He wanted to know how I was doing it. I don't know. Anyway, basically you put a DTI on it and then move it from side to side and that'll give you the bearing clearance. You just have to do a bit of trigonometry on the end of that, but it gives you the bearing clearance. If that is excessive, you will fuck everything up. Um, so you need to be aware of the, the preload. That is key. Um, preload systems, I'm doing a separate video on that, so stay tuned and look out for it. Right, now we come on to the conscious shitbag scale of engineering fuckwitism. Now have my pen so I can like draw shit. Ah, oh, yes, right. Um, I shouldn't really deface my own slides. Um, right, so we have the lick. The shiz, not a shitbag, borderline shitbag, definite shitbag, conscious shitbag, and speck of shite on the anus of humanity. In no particular order, we have SRAM. <clears throat> so they are on the border between definite shitbag and borderline shitbag. Um, yeah. Sh bollock heads who believe wider tyres are faster, so they're com incoming for a reaming. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, I mean, look at it. The, the world has changed in this, uh, just a few years. You know, the tyre companies, sorry, the wheel companies aren't really going after aero anymore. The next big thing is tyre pressure. Spokeless CFD, who the fuck does spokeless CFD? I mean, CFD, if you think is like the be all and end all, you are a fucking dickhead. Um, anyone who is not French is instantly a speck of shite on the anus of humanity. Shimano, now I think Shimano are probably gonna end up over here somewhere because of two reasons. The first is uh, my rear mech on my bike um, failed while I was on my turbo trainer. So I sent it off to Merlin Cycles, who I bought it from, um, and it's now been six weeks and I haven't had a replacement. So, um, yeah, they could end up over here. So while I respect their engineering, their customer service ain't the best and... Well, Merlin's, Merlin's customer services can be completely hit and miss. Um, and also they have the crank failure. So, you know, in line with the people, I'll move them. Next, we have the Look 695, because it is the dog's bollocks. Angela Merkel, she is between the shiz and not a shit bag, because she's fucking hot, man. Uh, fruitcake middle class time trialists who think they are fast. I'm not, I'm not um, singling out anyone in particular well I might be but there's plenty of them who think uh, you know I've got my new Pinarello F10 blah, blah, blah. That's, that, that's not even a time trial bike Pinarello Bolide and I think I'm the dog's bollock blah blah blah, blah. well when you meet Hambini's motor that will put you into place <laughs> sorry I spat all over the screen the combined engineering IQ of the UK cycling media I was struggling to give them a number, so I'll give them the number five. We all know who we're talking about. <sighs> FSA, so they are between definite shitbag and borderline shitbag because of this. I mean, it could be a historical thing. They tell me they fixed it, but it doesn't appear that they have yet. So, um, that's where we are with that one. And the Time Skylon. So that is where the Time Skylon is. It is over here. I mean, really, it's a bad thing that if time go bust or if this company that's bought time up 
do a bad job because that bike is really well made. That frame is really, really well made. So, uh, right, without further ado, let me take you back to the workshop. So all that remains for us to do now is to bolt the, uh, put the crank in and give it a spin. So let's try that. Right, <laughs> so we'll come around here, put that spacer in, and then bolt the crank up. Might just have to check this one a bit. Oh, fuck. Here we go. Just check that is home. Now the torque setting on it is 47 newton meters. That is quite a lot. See my calibrated torque wrench? Uh, yes. 47 is near enough 50, which is fucking tight on that. Right, now's the moment of truth. Let's give it a spin. Oh, fuck. Hmm, something not right there. I can feel something binding. Hmm. Right, we'll have to investigate. Fucking hell. Fuck. Ah, fuck. Fuck. Hmm, it's not supposed to do that. Um, shit. So, what we've got here is turd-like manufacturing. Finally figured out what the problem was, and it is this face was not flat, so it was binding. And you can, if you actually look for it, now it's there, you can clearly see, if you follow this line go round, it decays away to nothing, so the black bit gets wider, and then the silver bit gets wider on the way back round. So, it's, it's not flat, I mean you can, if I point there, that bit is much wider than that bit, which indicates it's not flat. The other thing, you can just about make this out, is I polished this and took out the high spots on the axles. Bear in mind this is a brand new axle and I had to remove, um, well not that much material, um, just to get it so it is perfectly round. So that, that was a correction, one on there. So that, that recess in there was fucking miles out. And um, yeah, the correction there and correction here. Now in the process of correcting it, so basically polishing it out, this happened. So if I zoom back out. Oh, fuck. Right. Hopefully, I'm saying hopefully, you can see these marks on here. They all, they're, they're pit marks. And those pit marks are a sign of contamination in the metal. Um, so they're in a line which indicates the forging was in that direction. Um, and the same thing, 180 degrees on the other side. Admittedly on this side, they're, um, I mean it wasn't as high as this side. So the high spot corresponds to where the pit marks, which indicates the uh, contamination. The other thing is, this piece is aluminium, this piece is carbon. So there's a bond or some other fixing system between here and here that's in there. So when they've done that bond, that connection is shit. So when it's been going round, and this is why the guy had trouble with a binding uh, crank, it's been trying to basically go like that as it goes round. Obviously I can't do it because I'm a fucking numb nuts. Yeah, something like that. Okay, that does look like a pissed up dancer, but fuck. Anyway, it's just shit. That absolute fucking whack. I can't believe someone's actually sold this. 
Um, that doesn't really do a good advert for FSA. Um, that's not good at all. And obviously this bit where the recess is, that's the bit that fucked me over because this piece goes in there and it's on the piss. I'm, okay, it's exaggerated. And then it pushes the bearing correspondingly on the piss, which is why it wouldn't move. Um, I mean, you could feel that. When, when I was turning, I could feel a sort of um, biting and vibration in there. Um, what I'll do is I will take you back to the PowerPoint just to discuss this to show you what's happening. Now, I don't think I've ever had to do two PowerPoints on one video, but fucking hell, this is shit. This is absolute fucking wank of epic proportions. It's so bad that I want to slash my wrists. <sighs> right, firstly, this is the, um, where's the fucking pen? Oh, fuck. Right, I've got the pen back, right. What I've done is, I've taken some pictures because I don't think it came out very well in the video, but um, I mean, if you look here, this anodizing is extremely uneven. Um, I've, I've basically polished the sides up, but what you can see is the, you know, for, for anodizing to work well, you need a key. Um, so you tend to roughen the surface up slightly, then etch it, and then um, then dip it. And then that's how the anodizing works. Now, in this case, the, I mean, you can see the key. I mean, I'm not really dissing um, FSA for putting a key in. I mean, that's that's what you would do. Um, you can also see the, the rougher area around here. So where it's all dimpled, um, which is like a natural finish. Um, but, there's also a load of oh, pitting. Um, and the pitting is, oh shit, here. Now I asked um, one of the material guys I work with, you know, what is that? And he said, he said, he thought there was contaminants in the forging. So the way this thing's made is there are you know, contaminants in there, and then um, you forge it, and then you get these little cavities. Now you can see it clearly on the machine surface, and you can also see it here, which is probably the rough machine surface. Now, uh, there's also some evidence here. Now, the camera has probably zoomed in a bit more than necessary, but I've um, polished this basically with um, with some, um, what's the word? Uh, some wet and dry um, to take this off. Now, in the process of doing it, you can see the high spots. So the high spots show you, I mean, that, that's a high spot. I don't think it's, um, it's purely coincidence that the high spot and the contaminants are in the same area and neither did he. Um, I mean, you can see another high spot there. Over here, the um, the area is fairly clean. Um, so it's actually indicating a low spot, but there was a high spot over on the other side. So that's why they couldn't push the bearing in all that easily. Um, I mean, that is, okay, there's, there's pitting there. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but it's, don't really, you know, set a, a good example. And the reason these lines are, um, you know, crisscross is they probably went when they were polishing up in a in a figure of eight pattern at a certain speed, um, and then to, to give you that. Um, and also, when the etching goes on, it's not uniform, so you can't control the tolerance all that well. Then we come on to this, which is. Ah, uh, this is just drivel. So I uh, wish I hadn't drawn it. If you, if you look at this silver area here, and I'm gonna point here, look at the width of that, okay? And then follow that round and you can see that it decays away to almost nothing. Um, that eccentricity is almost two millimeters. Um, 
which is an eighth of an inch, coming up to an eighth of an inch. I think three mils, eighth of an inch, two mils, not that far, is it? Um, and then as you get over here, you can see it's starting to widen up a bit. So it's wide over here, and then um, narrows down, and then it's wide again here. So there is wider, there is wide, there is wide, and there is thin. So you can see that. Now this seat here, and this seat here are not perpendicular. So the, the axle, which is here, and this piece are supposed to be perpendicular, and they're not miles out. And that gives us the problem with why this thing fucking wouldn't turn, which is on this slide. So. The, actual, the uniform loading, so this is, you apply your force this way to load it up. Yeah, so that's when you bolt the crank arm on it, it goes up, the force comes through here. And here. It actually goes through the bearing first, so you go through there, yeah. Then you get to this bearing, and it comes through to here, yeah. And also comes through to here. Now on the top side of the bearing, you can see there's there's contact between at this point, so it loads up. On this bearing, on this piece, which is the bit which is far away, there's a gap. Yeah, so that gap causes uh, the whole thing to cockle slightly. So instead of it being, you know, perfectly straight, it it looks like it's at an angle, like that, and that's why as you turn it you feel it binding right that is hopefully the last time we have to come back to this fucking powerpoint i mean it, oh shit just just i'll just take you back right so let's try that again so we've got the crank with the spacer all been polished up that's been phased so the um, axial position should be the dog's bollocks. That's all in. Push that in nice and hard. Space on the other side. And then here we go. Our a bunch of fuck stains about to get one over on Hambini. Well, no one's got one over on me yet, but that could all change. Right. Ah, fucking hell. That felt like 40 newton meters. Ah, oh, yes. Fuck that. Yes. Fucking hell. What a piece of shit. So. My absolute recommendation is don't waste your time with this fucking piece of shit FSA K-Force crank set because it is a load of fucking wank. Well, this particular one was. Ah, uh, this, yeah, this particular one, absolute load of fucking bull. I can't, can you tell I'm slightly pissed off by this whole saga? I am completely fucked up. Fuck, fucked off is an understatement because this, this should not be going out the door like that. To be able to fix that was serious amounts of buggeration. Um, now, if I was the, the chap whose bike this is, you know, he, he can run that now. There's nothing, nothing's gonna um, stop him from running it. Um, and he'll probably get good life out of it. But he is an individual who probably doesn't have all of the measuring gear, the DTIs and all of that stuff to be able to find that fault. And that fault was an absolute fucker. If, um, if he'd just gone out with that, he'd have a load of drag, and worse still, he'd have poor bearing life. So he'd be going through bearings pretty quickly with that. I don't know how many crank sets are out there with the same fault, or with the same shite manufacturing. So the contaminants in the aluminium, that's not really gonna hurt anybody, but the the fact that this piece and the um, spindle aren't square on with each other and um, you've got, you know, 
fuck loads of run out is completely unacceptable. Absolute fucking horse shit. Fucking hell, I just fucking Jesus. Fuck. And that brings us to the end of this video. The moral of the story is, if someone's fucked you over, they're gonna fuck you over again. So, last time we've had an FS, ah, fuck. So I'm in a bit of a mood. Um, they, we, we've had FSA on the show before and they didn't really cover themselves in glory. So we've had them on again and they fucked us over. The time frame is really good. This FSA crank set is utterly fucking wank. This particular one, especially, is utterly fucking shit. So I would avoid it if you can. Now, um, if you did enjoy this video, remember to whack the like button. If you didn't, um, whack the dislike button. It's good for the algorithm. And if you've got any questions, then ask in the comments box below. Um, thanks very much, and until next time.